Can you introduce yourself? My name is Jim Brown. I'm a veteran of the United States military, specifically the Army, about 10 years worth of experience in that. When have you been in Iraq? I was in uh, Saudi Arabia in support of the troops that went to Iraq, and that started on September 25th, and I actually left the area of Saudi Arabia around um, February 16th, 1991. What happened over there that has never been revealed before? The United States military, in conjunction with their allies, dropped a nuclear weapon, approximately five kilotons in yield, in the area of Basra, Iraq. Where was it used? Yes, the bomb was used between the area of the city of Basra and the Iranian border. Who dropped it? It was the United States military, and the weapon that they used was a five kiloton, sometimes called a dialable yield atomic weapon. What kind of weapon was it? It is essentially a heavy duty penetrator, and when it's dropped, it actually penetrates the target, goes to the center of the target, or in this case, into the ground very deeply and explodes there. It's also used for area denial, which means that it irradiates the area that is dropped in temporarily, and it's a pretty good message if you want to tell people to stay away. It's also known as a bunker buster. Based on veteran Jim Brown's charges, a small 5 kiloton nuclear bomb went off between the Iraqi city of Basra and the border with Iran during the first Gulf War. Should that be the case, it would be the third nuclear bomb ever used in a conflict after the ones in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A 5 kiloton nuclear bomb is a relatively small bomb, smaller than the Hiroshima nuke, 16 kilotons and the Nagasaki bomb, 22 kilotons. Its radioactivity effects, though, are just as terrible. We learn about Jim Brown's report through William Thomas, a Canadian journalist who worked a lot with U.S. Army's veterans and put us in contact with Brown. Aren't you afraid to show your face talking about that? Define a fright. <laughs> um, there's a point where you just have to say enough is enough, literally. You, you have to make that decision. And when you step across that line, there really isn't a lot of company. <laughs> you, you're, you're either going to do it or you're not. And when I joined the military, I raised my right hand and I said, this I'll defend. This is the way that I defend it. Who's Jim Brown, born in 1965, he joined the Army at age 22. He became a mechanical engineer for the 10th Mountain Division in Fort Drum. He took part in Desert Storm in Saudi Arabia from September 25, 1990 to February 16, 1991. He then came back home for family reasons and started suffering from weird disorders. Like other veterans, he started a long fight for his disease to be recognized. He says he was taken ill because of an anthrax vaccine that it had been injected in Saudi Arabia. In 1997, he was officially reprimanded for some quarrels and demoted from level four to level three engineer. The demotion would not allow him to perform the duty he had been charged with. As a consequence, he was discharged, although with honor. Brown has already been covered by major media because of his activity within US Army veterans such as, for example, in this article by the New York Times in 2003. Also, he was heard by the Presidential Advisory Committee on Gulf War Veterans' Illnesses. He established a veteran organization called Gulf Watch Intelligent Networking System when he came back from the Gulf War. For the first time ever, Jim Brown, under an assumed name, has been talking about a small nuclear bomb on Canadian journalist Thomas Williams' website. This is actually the first television interview by Jim Brown on the issue. 
Why was it used? The best reason that I have been able to verify so far is to send a message to Saddam that we were serious about ending this war, getting the conflict over with. How have his accounts been corroborated? We checked whether an earthquake with the same power as five kilotons had been recorded by the International Seismographic Station's online database in the area around the city of Basra, Iraq. Five kilotons equal in approximately 4.2 magnitude on the Richter scale. We found that the only seismic event that occurred during desert storms was a 4.2 magnitude event on the Richter scale and was recorded precisely in the area indicated by Jim Brown between the city of Basra and the border with Iran. It was catalogued under number 342793 and took place on February 27, 1991, precisely the last day of the conflict, at 1.39 p.m. The event was recorded by nine seismic stations, two located in Iran, four in Nepal, one in Canada, one in Sweden, and one in Norway. The latter two also measured an approximately 4.2 magnitude explosion. Its depth falls under the shallow earthquake category, ranging between 0 and 33 kilometers. Further information can be obtained by analyzing the seismic waves recorded by stations in various countries. Yet, given the huge work to accomplish, we call upon international nuclear control agencies, as well as the national seismic stations concerned, to help us collect final and resolutive elements to understand whether there was an explosion or an earthquake. Within what historical and political framework could the weapon mentioned by the veteran have been used during Desert Storm? Let's review the sequence of events. On August 2nd, 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. On January 16th, 1991, U.S. President George Bush announced the beginning of Desert Storm to the world. It was to be the largest war operation after 1948. 28 countries took action alongside the U.S. And how would the Islamic world have reacted? We want to lay the foundation that would put uh, us in a position to have a credible option of using force, but that is far different than saying that the president has taken a decision to move in that direction. We would like there to be a very clear, and we think it is, clear and unmistakable signal that uh, when the president says he cannot rule that out as an option, we have in fact not only not ruled it out as an option, but have it as a credible option. Had Saddam Hussein used chemical or bacteriological weapons the Pentagon might have even responded with an atomic bomb. Deliberate ambiguity remains, though, on the use of nuclear weapons. Indeed, the U.S. Secretary of State himself coined the term calculated ambiguity doctrine. It was a win-win situation for the United States. They could drop this bomb in one of the most isolated areas that were available at that time. It was in the middle of a conflict so things could be seen and not really seen for what they are. Since this would detonate under the ground, you may see a small version of a nuclear blast go off. But if you're far enough away, you won't know what happened. The effect will be immediate and then long-lasting. So. Yet another weapon made its debut on battlefield in 1991 depleted uranium. During there's a storm, a lot of depleted uranium bullets have been used. Why? Um, depleted uranium and what they call non-depleted uranium both have a similar enough signature that one could be mistaken for the other. The use of one could be mistaken for the other. Also with depleted uranium, the immediate effects of something like that on individuals inside of vehicles, tanks, buildings, things of that nature, will mimic what you get with a larger nuclear blast, such as desiccation of the body, death, immediate and further down the road, uh, bleeding of the eyes, nose, um, the radiation pulse that's released by the use of uh, 
smaller depleted uranium projectiles is still present, but if it's used repeatedly, such as with um, the GAU-8 that the A-10 aircraft uses, one bullet hitting one after the other after the other is going to cause a higher impact radiologically, not just the leftover debris, but also the immediate radiation burst that's released by the impact and it flashing in the plane. It can help to cover up. Yes. It can, it can mask pretty much anything in that area. If veteran Jim Brown's report held true, what event could have frustrated the U.S. administration to use a mini-nuke precisely on the last day of the war? One can only make an assumption. Two days before the possible decision to deliver a nuclear bomb, February 25th, a Scud missile launched by the Iraqis hit a U.S. base in Dahran, Saudi Arabia, killing 28 U.S. troops and injuring 99. That caused a strong reaction from the U.S. In the night between February 26th and February 27th, an entire vehicle column was destroyed just over the border with Kuwait. Maybe that was not the only retaliation action. It is a hasty assumption, but the U.S. administration's policy in 1991 was deliberately ambiguous. Are there any witnesses? There are some witnesses. I personally have spoken with individuals that were there during the time frame that this occurred. I know of other people that have talked to other people. I know that sounds weird, but that's the way the intelligence community works. You hear something from an individual, you verify it through others, eventually you flesh out the entire detail and you get the full story. Where governments are concerned, no government would ever want to admit to doing just something of this nature. How did you know about it? The organization that I put together since 1991, known as Gulf Watch INS, we have been trying for a long time to get this information together and put it out into the public so that we can stop this from happening again. Because I guarantee you, if they got away with it in 1991, they got away with it in 2002, they will continue to get away with it as long as they are allowed to. This has to stop. Before airing this interview, we notified the U.S. Defense Department that a U.S. Army veteran told us that a mini-nuke had been used during Desert Storm. We were asked for clarifications on the exact day when that supposedly took place, and we were sent the following statement. Only conventional munitions were used during the Gulf War in 1991. The U.S. maintains a number of munitions that have an explosive capability of 5,000 pounds and larger. It is not possible for us to confirm the exact incident that you are referring to, but if a large bomb was dropped in that location, it is reasonable to assume that the detonation would register on seismological detection equipment. Again, only conventional munitions were used during the 1991 Gulf War. In a following letter, the Defense Department informed us that the BLU-82 bomb could have been used. The device has an explosive capability of approximately 7,000 tons, and they reiterated that only conventional weapons were used. The BLU-82 bomb, also called Mother of All Bombs, or Daisy Cutter, through the explosion of a mixture of oxygen, hydrogen, and other elements in the air, not underground, produces approximately magnitude 3 on the Richter scale, and not 4.2 as it appears from the seismic data. These were also used in the same time frame as the FAE, or fuel air explosive bombs, also known as the Moab, mother of all bombs. The, the big difference between these two is the Moab, or the fuel air or FE bomb, will give you the effect of a nuclear bomb. It can even cause a mushroom cloud, that sort of thing. But the residual radiation is not there. Where a nuclear warhead is concerned, when it detonates, you not only get the effect, but you also get the residual radiation. You also get fallout. This is something that doesn't just happen and then go away. This is something that happens and stays and stays 
to date, Jim Brown's account is as chilling as it is devoid of any element confirming its truthfulness. Brown's view that the use of depleted uranium might have covered a nuclear bomb's explosion remains a mere assumption, which, however, we duly report as we follow the principle of precaution. Whenever any assumption, which is not obviously false, bears such a dramatic social relevance, it is much better to talk about it rather than just wait and see. Indeed, many people and too many children were taken ill after a desert storm in the area around Basra. We managed to contact Dr. Jawad Al Ali, director of the Oncology Center at the hospital in Basra, during a conference in Istanbul. Al Ali conducted a number of studies on radioactivity in Basra. The story of radiation in Basra started uh, during the war, the first Gulf War in 1991, where uh, about 300 tons of depleted uranium dropped at the western part of Basra, which led to increased level of radiation many times if it is compared to the background level in Basra, which is nearly zero. In 1991, the attack was more aggressive because they destroy all the infrastructure of Iraq completely. And so we couldn't at that time travel from Basra to Baghdad. The problem is repeated again in 2003. And in this time, um, many hundreds of tons of depleted uranium dropped on the cities, on the civilian. And this problem is creating another problem, which is the increase in the cancer rates, increase in the congenital malformations. As you know, the half-life of depleted uranium is 4.5 billion of years. So the problem is uh, something to kill the people of Iraq by putting a poison in their soil for um, billions of years. Is it easy to do inquire about radiation in Basra? They don't want anybody to talk about radiation except the officials. And we are not officials. We got a permission to do the uh, research, uh, the cancer rates, the cancer registry, but not the to study the risk factors, and they didn't fund any of these uh, research. Doing investigations on radiation is difficult in Iraq as well as in Italy. Let's hear the experience of the then Minister of the Environment, Gianni Mattioli. Nel gennaio 2001 che eh, chiede di incontrarmi il ministro della sanità iracheno Mubarak nel corso dell'incontro eh, Mubarak mi eh, presenta gli elementi per una situazione eh, davvero grave eh, per eh, zone eh, che erano state bombardate con eh, proiettili all'uranio impoverito. La richiesta da parte del ministro Mubarak è quella che l'Italia collabori a una ricerca epidemiologica per mettere in evidenza la dimensione della problematica, la individuazione delle zone e anche possibilità in qualche modo di innescare salvaguardie. Venni a sapere che c'era una precisa eh, obiezione, eh, un vero e proprio divieto da parte eh, dell'amministrazione eh, atlantica, del patto atlantico. Despite the bans on radioactivity research, data on radiation effects over the years start to emerge dramatically. And this graph shows the mortality rate which is increasing significantly 
to a very high level to reach 600 or more than 600 in 2001 and uh, very few only 34 I think in uh, in 1988 with regard to the pictures I collect all the pictures which are strange like malignant fibrous histiocytoma which is a tumor which I know uh, it's very rare and it's closely related to radiation. I collected pictures of children who have cancers because some of the cancers they shift from elderly patient to younger age group and this is strange. We call it a change in the pattern of cancer. If it is changed from an elderly man to a child which you saw uh, is only six years. This is a very strange lymphoma, the cancer of the lymph nodes uh, doesn't occur in, in children less than 10 years. It's very rare. The other pictures are pictures of families, a wife and a husband. I got, uh, I studied about uh, 31 uh, families with more than one cancer patient in the family and uh, the number of these families is increasing really from 31 to more than 70 families now I got uh, more than one cancer in family uh, this map shows the familial cancer we call them 21 families in the center 7 families in the northern part and 2 at the south, 1 at the east and this is the percentage uh, distribution of five common cancers uh, in Basra. The disastrous effects of the war in Basra are crystal clear. The possible causes include, amongst others, radiation, which, according to Dr. Jawad al-Ali, was caused by depleted uranium. Brown's claim i.e. depleted uranium weapons were covering up the use of a nuclear bomb is only an assumption and we reiterate that. What is certain, however, is that uranium-based weapons were cleared in 1991. Depleted uranium shells became part of NATO's, Israel's, Russia's and other countries' arsenals and came to join nuclear bombs in arsenals of the US, UK, France, Israel, Russia, China India, Pakistan, and other countries, ready to be used on battlefield. As we come across such a dreadful reality, let us not close our eyes as we watch the pictures of some of the victims treated by Dr. Jawadi. This is Isra Ali. She is uh, 15 years old, and she got acute uh, leukemia, and she died because of her uh, leukemia. This is Wala Abid Mozan. She is five years old and she got a tumor of the ovary which is rare in this age. It's a disease of middle-aged woman. This is an elderly lady with a big lymphoma that is tumor of the lymph nodes in the, in the neck and in the uh, upper chest. This child, who is only uh, five years old, he got non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which is rare, uh, below the age of 10. And he died on the first day of admission to hospital. This child is 14 years. His name is Leif, and he got cancer of the bone and this cancer is spread to his chest and he died because of this cancer. Again, this child is three year girl, three years old girl with non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which is rare at this age, and she died also after doing an operation on her chest. This lady has cancer of the bone, at the jaw, hair, and 
She is from those who were refugees in, in Iran and she is living at the borders. This is a lady, a young lady, Sheba, who is 12, 12 years. She got a cancer of the, of the bone here and this cancer spread to her chest and her arm is cut for that reason but she died. This child has a big head and he got water inside his, his skull. I saw many of these uh, pictures in Hiroshima after the explosion. Has it been used again? It was used in Afghanistan in 2002. Do you know the time rate, time, time range? Well, it was between the 1st and the 3rd of March of 2002. We urge our media colleagues around the world, as well as international nuclear control organizations, to work with us to help verify these kinds of reports.